Okay, you guys. <laughs> I'll start with you. <laughs> I want to talk about overfills. Recently, the American Endodontic Association put out um, some information saying that they found that the vast majority of um, treatment that had an overfill had a higher success or had a higher failure rate. And so, in other lectures that I've had um, with uh, this group, not you in particular, I've heard that the sealer actually is sedative to the uh, apical uh, tissues. What What's your feeling? Okay. Um, I'm kind of dogmatic, so sorry, but, but I'm not always right. I'm usually wrong. <laughs> that would be the first disclaimer. But uh, I was trained there's no such thing as an overfill. Uh, I was trained you could only fill a root canal system 100%, and then there, thereafter everything was surplus after filling. Sounds like semantics, right? Okay. So John West uh, wanted to understand failure, and it had been described many, many times, so it wasn't a new idea, but what he did is he collected uh, almost 200 teeth from oral surgeons around the United States, and he made three requests. He said, uh, take a preoperative film, probe the sulcus, and send me the tooth. And these were endodontic failures. So the oral surgeon started taking teeth out and sending John teeth. He was a resident who was doing research and he was going to study failures. So what he did is he put those teeth, well first he isolated the teeth and anything that had a crestal defect, he threw it out of the study because it could be a what? A fracture. It could be a fracture or a perio problem. <clears throat> and then he used a, a light microscope, histo, because we didn't have, there were scopes in medicine but there wasn't really scopes back in that era, early 70s. So he used a histoscope and he looked at the roots and he looked for radicular fractures. So he threw out all teeth that had radicular fractures, all teeth that had crestal defects, and so what he had left was a genuine pool of endodontic failures. He put them in a centrifuge, he used pelican ink, and he spun pelican ink into them, and he found out that 100% of all failures had at least one missed portal of exit. So from that informal study, it only shed more light on Ingalls' work and a lot of people's. The cases really don't fail because, uh, I want to make the distinction, because of overfills, because really the so-called overfill is oftentimes internal underfilling. So we need to make a clear distinction between vertically overextended and internally underfilled versus filled 100% and surplus. So a lot of the cases in the older years, you'd see a silver point two millimeters long and the profession would say, yeah, it's that old silver point sticking out through the foramen. Well, you could spin pelican ink in and it didn't go in, but it might go in laterally. So really, I don't really think cases fail because of surplus. I'm not talking about packing the sinus in three dimensions, but you know, with some <laughs> degree of reasonableness, case, I don't really think cases fail because of surplus. There's different sealers. I'm going to pick on Ben because I, I know Ben the best in the room and I consider Ben a dear friend, but he used to ask questions internationally when we were lecturing and he would say, so I'll ask the group and then I'll let Ben, Ben ask the question. You said you would always be on stage and say, you have three choices. Okay, you have three choices. Uh, number one, you tell me you don't want to be overextended, but tomorrow you're going to do a root canal and you are going to be overextended. I'm going to give you three choices. Do you want that to be the plastic carrier of thermophil? Do you want it to be the gutta percha? Or do you want it to be the sealer? And when I ask the question, 75 to 95 percent of you will say you want it to be the sealer. Well, the plastic carrier for thermophil is biocompatible. No problem. The gutta percha, let's say, is biotolerated. It's not biocompatible, but it gets along pretty well with periapical tissues. The sealer is toxic. You don't want to be overextended because you don't want to damage the periodontal ligament, but when I give you the choice, you choose something that's toxic to the material. So that's what we refer to as cognitive dissonance. You're 180 degrees away from what you truly believe in. The reason you choose sealer is because six months later it'll be resorbed on the x-ray and nobody knows you messed up. But if you truly don't want to disturb the periodical tissues, you would not choose sealer as your choice. And, and another thing, just to play off of that, is there's a lot of differences in even, even the formulation of sealers. And 
uh, as an example, we always have, Phyllis always schedules the residents. So we have UCLA, uh, Loma Linda, USC, and the Long Beach VA. And those four programs send their kids to Santa Barbara. So we get each class in their first year for Shape Clean Pack, and the second year we give them non-surgical retreatment. But the USC kids came up, this is now a few years ago, and they were, I was showing them some cases and stuff, and what they began to immediately, I could hear them talking among themselves, so finally I said, shut down. What, tell me, what's going on here? And they were saying, well, almost all your cases have puffs of cement on the lateral aspect of roots uh, associated with the POEs, portals of exit. And they said, if we got that, our patients are in agony. And I said, okay, now I get it. So what are you using? So I asked a question. And they said they were using AH26. Well, at that time, you could go to the JOE, and I think in a two-year span the JOE, there were three articles, and they declared that AH26 was the most cytotoxic cement on the market. After 72 hours, it was as well tolerated as any other sealer. So the whole key was to get something, if it's going to be extended through a POE, you want things to set rapidly and become biologically inert so healing can begin. So I think it's critical to make the distinction as the case really, uh, I don't even like the word overfilled because there's no such thing. Is it overextended and underfilled or is it filled 100% and there's surplus after filling? And you know, around this room, where, uh, let me understand my audience. Where's the GPs? Okay, perfect. So I want to hear from the endodontist. You do a lot of cases and you've been practicing for a lot of years. And if you do a, a three-dimensional technique or an attempt to, we'll get splashes. Speak. Definitely. D any yeah. problems? Um, not that I can ever uh, perceive and not anything that's ever uh, a consistent complaint. But yes, get uh, excess sealer all the time. I, I get it on every case. In fact, we look for a puff. And I know this is kind of, we could have a big argument about this, but we were so stupid when we were kids back in Boston in the early days that we were even taught that the puff was a magnet for bone. <laughs> we, were sit, we were taught it was a bone magnet. Well, what I understood years later when I really got through the joke part of it is it meant that if everything is completely sealed, then the body has an enormous capacity to heal. So really, now that we're putting fixtures in and all this stuff, it's, it's less relevant. But that's exactly how I got into education. I went to Santa Barbara. This is back in the middle 70s. And I opened my practice, and I was so proud of these cases. I was going around curves and getting POEs. I'd send the case back to the referral, and they wouldn't restore it. Because most of the town in that era was from UCLA, USC, and any puff beyond the root was terrible. And it was like the case is prejudiced and it's going to contribute to failure. So they wouldn't restore the teeth because they were certain that this case was going to fail with time. So a couple guys approached me that were more open to puffs and they were understanding that it was an attempt to do three dimensional treatment. And they said, Would you start a study club? And I said, No, for two years. And finally, I started a study club. And that kind of led to teaching. Good. Good question. Follow up on that. <clears throat> You know, uh, there's a lot, a lot being said there, but what's the science on it? Because he, he referred to a paper that says there's an increased rate of failure. So what's the science on it? Uh, is there more failure with cement out there? Is there more failure with gutta percha out there? Is there more failure with plastic out there? What's the science? The science, I think, is, is up and down. And that's one of the problems with our science. We have, well, I don't want to get too controversial tonight, but I'm going to digress but hold your question. So I'm asking everybody. Do we have good clinical science to illuminate our clinical pathway? Just a question. OK, so you don't want to play. <laughs> so we'll try it again. So do we have great clinical science that you or you or any of us can look at, and it can tell us a lot about our clinical actions? Yeah. So if we have great science, raise your hand. I want to see where you are on this one. Yeah. There's science both ways. There's science both ways. But I mean, do we have the truth? Because Ben could read a paper, and I can read one, and I can say I disagree with you because I have this paper and he has this. Well, we have to look into the methodology, and all of a sudden, we have to start analyzing stuff. But just to support my assertion, we have great science in stem cells, uh, inflammation, pathology, uh, 
wound healing, and it goes on and on and on. Great science. But now I'll just ask the group real quick. So do we all do we have universal science on the best pulp testing schemes? No. no. Do we have do we have uh, universal agreement on the size of the access cavity? No. 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 Do we have do we have agreement on glide path? And within glide path, is it rotary? Is it manual? Do, do we? Do you want to talk? Just a second. Do we go to a 25? At some schools, we got to take stainless steel up to a 30 before we put a rotary. And he's dying to talk, but just hold it. Do we have any universal agreement? Do we go to length immediately, or do we lay back in longer ones, narrow ones, and more curved ones? Do we have universal agreement on the files themselves? Do we have universal agreement on the size of the foramen? Do we understand the importance of taper, deep shape? Do we have universal agreement on disinfection? We don't even agree on sodium hypochlorite. Is it is it full speed or is it is it six percent or do you go to Clorox and, and go to the company Vista and you get ten percent pooled stuff? I mean, is it EDTA? Is it CHX? Is it chlorhexidine? We have no agreement on virtually anything, and we certainly don't even have an agreement on obturation. So when we talk about science, I want us to have a serious talk because science is important and when it's properly performed with good methodology. So no one has taken rather overfill effects, failure rates, and done good science on that? Yeah, the Scandinavians Scandinavian. did. Okay. And they actually said flush with the apex was their highest rates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Am I correct on that? So there's but, the science. <laughs> but keep in mind, but, flush with the apex is overextended. Oh, it's long. Because right. yeah. the cemento-dental junction averages 1.3 millimeters That's from right. the radiographic apex. Mm -hmm. Now, they use, they use the analogy of flush with the apex or slightly short of the apex, within one millimeter of the apex. They call that synonymous with being inside tooth structure, but anatomically, that's not true. That's beyond the cemento-dental junction. Well, I don't care about the rationale. I just care about the results. No, the results, that was the the results. results yeah. clearly show... And that was histological results. Histologic results clearly show that slightly through the terminus of the root canal, in other words, slightly into the peri periaqueal tissue, has the highest results rates. Yeah. So that's what we should try strive for, right? And, and so the thing that was kind of ironic when that came out, if, if you're familiar and have been following the Scandinavian literature like since the 60s and 50s, they had some great people, but we didn't always see it the same. But I have a lot of friends up there, and probably a lot of you guys do too. But they had always said one millimeter short. That was their whole premise. And you didn't ever have a puff. That was like not good. And so when they did this long term study with histological fall off, it was kind of like it refuted their own theories previously uh, advocated. I feel more comfortable when I have a puff because I know I've probably got three dimensional film. Absolutely. So I feel more comfortable in that case. However, it seems like we want to minimize that puff. Yes. From based I mean, on the science. There was a lady that approached me some years ago, and she said, Dr. Ruddle, I really want to do warm gutta percha. And I said, well, that's great, hon. I can help you do that. That's like about a two-hour chore if we have the shape. So the more we talked, she said, you know, I want to do it just like you, but I, I don't want to see a puff. And I said, hon, I can't help you. Because you can't be moving rubber around and sealer in a, in a complex space and you know at least we fit a cone or size a, a size verifier to the terminus but we're not doing anything laterally so when we start to build up hydraulics we're going to get surplus so i agree with you 100 percent we'd like to ruddles puffs are too big then i don't see them makes it thinner <laughs> then they're too big makes it heavier <laughs> you know we're always kind of cyclic through our lives, our shapes are too big, they need to be more conservative, coronally to protect the tooth structure. So I like to see puffs because it's hard for me to understand hydraulically how there could be dead space and still get a little bit of surplus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. Uh, another part, along with what you're talking about, is the dental education is basically guilt. I mean, you remember when you would do it. <laughs> a wax crown and you'd take it to the professor and he'd go, oh, that's not so good and you'd crunch it. I mean, it's your fault because it wasn't. You're used to, to assuming guilt. And uh, when you separate an instrument, what do you tell the patient? Ah, I fractured a, an instrument. Instead of saying, you know, your tooth was so complicated it caused the fracture of an instrument. You're always assuming guilt. And when you say a puff, I wish it weren't that big. Well, how small do you want it to be? And when it's not there, then how do you feel, you know, so. But I don't strip my rubber out yeah. if I don't see a puff. Yeah, so. 
learn something and move on. You know, in the, in the words of my second and third <laughs> wife, I married her twice, if it were not for guilt, I'd have no emotional life at all. So, <laughs> so get over the guilt. You know, if you're striving for three-dimensional observation, true. that's going to imply that you have a little excess. Little being a relative term. Out of curiosity, how many people in the room are doing some form of warm gutta percha? Okay. And so how many are doing like vertical? Continuous wave. Carrier based. Okay. Great. I think it's important if you got the shape and we're going through the effort of disinfection, let's make the effort to stuff it, right? And then we're going to get some splashes. <laughs>